And uh, all the examples that you have given are also uh, leading me to uh, go back to one word that you, Mr. Kamel, mentioned, was, it was alternative proteins. So uh, alternative proteins is uh, meat without uh, cows, you know, uh, including up to uh, uh, 3D printing, etc. So I know there's a lot of curiosity about this issue. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask all of you uh, in two minutes each uh, whether you think this is a possible solution for uh, the future of food, not only as a tiny niche uh, uh, area, but something that could really be a full-scale uh, solution. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Cullen, if you have uh, correctly uh, heard me, and if you would like to start, you know, really two, two, two three minutes uh, each, just giving a feeling about what is, you know, something that for everybody is uh, absolutely beyond <laughs> understanding to up to a certain extent. Please, if you can ref uh, tell me again what is the solution you're referring to. Uh, I, I cannot hear you correctly. Okay. Uh, I, I'm asking whether you think that alternative proteins uh, can be a, a, a full-scale solution for nutrition and not only uh, some kind of uh, niche uh, scientific uh, experiment. Sure. Okay. So, look, I, I, I don't think it's the only solution that we have to look at. Okay? Because the, the importance here is that it's not just proteins, but it's other elements that are required in a nutritious diet and a healthy diet. And when we look at all the rest of animals, for example, there is a diversity of micronutrients that are provided, which are important. I think the challenge on the other side is how we are able to balance things, because we have countries that overconsume proteins and countries which are completely under consuming protein. If we are able to achieve that balance, I think we can bring that solution which is more efficient and could resolve significant problems of under consumption of proteins we have and at the same time cope with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially related to livestock uh, production. So it's one element which could contribute, but I don't see it as an overall solution to the challenge. So there are alternative solutions to alternative proteins. Okay. Mr. Kamal, would like to continue? Yeah, first, uh, this is relatively in, in new area. I mean, it's only on the last five, six years. I think everybody tried the Impossible Burger and, and other uh, similar products. It's here to stay. We are still at the pre-paradigm era. We don't have a clear way of how to do it. And more important, we don't have assurance of the health and safety long-term benefits uh, associated with it. But if you think of life on Mars, for example, and here we always say in the desert in Egypt, uh, we are reclaiming Mars because we don't have water, we don't have soil, uh, we don't have electricity, what have you. If you think of life on Mars, let's say, of course you will be using what you call uh, food in the lab. Uh, uh, so I believe it's here to stay, it will grow, it's important. Definitely continuing to have more and more cows and more and more gas emissions uh, as a source of us uh, getting uh, meat is not going to be sustainable and we have to wait uh, to see what will happen. But it will go mainstream in another couple of, couple of years, I believe. Already major, major investments are done there and uh, we'll have to see yet the economic return. Still, there is no positive economic return on this, but I think it will continue to, to happen. So, Kuri? Yeah, I think so as well. I think that um, alternative proteins would, uh, at the moment it is niche and perhaps it will continue to be niche until it is no longer uh, a niche. And perhaps what would help it to not become, uh, not continue to be niche is technology, it's, it's research. Uh, this evokes, for example, the question that uh, many years ago was at the point of uh, debate with regards to technology and is genetically, uh, genetically modified uh, foods, for example. Before now, there was a lot of debate about the health uh, benefits or the health implications of 
genetically modified foods. But today, food technology has shown us that it is not only possible, but possible to do it safely to fortify foods with the nutrients that are, are required, whether they are uh, proteins or vitamins or as the case may be. So with regards to whether uh, alternative proteins will be able to provide at scale the kinds of uh, 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 benefits that we need in order to, to, to make it economically viable is, is still questionable. But I think what is encouraging is that it's becoming more and more possible with technology, with science, uh, to fortify with more nutrients what we, we consume uh, already. But it's definitely a, uh, a very interesting topic that should be on the, on the table of both public and private sector. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. Mr. Park, would yeah, you concur? I, I, I agree. Like, theoretically, you know, almost everything is possible, right? Like, uh, you know, the fortifying uh, vegetables you know, it's possible. And then we can also, uh, you know, modify the taste of the uh, vegetables, right? If uh, in certain region, they produce uh, best carrot, then we can study, you know, the, the, the land and then the climate of the region, and we can mimic the same condition in the indoor vertical farm, and we can produce uh, same type of uh, food. But, you know, we still need, uh, you know, a long way to go, but, uh, as uh, you know, all the technology develops, it starts with the niche, and then it becomes uh, the main uh, technology. So I think uh, it's not gonna solve all the problem, but uh, it could be a big part of the, the solving problem of food in the future. Okay, so I understand that you're cautious, but rather positive, if I could summarize this kind of feeling. Now <laughs>